Good morning. morning. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for choosing to be with us today at Spindale United Methodist Church. We're glad that you're here. Uh, I have some announcements. Please note that there will be a media team meeting next Sunday, January 8th at 3 p.m. Our January Ministry of the Month is the Super Bowl of Hearing. We are collecting cans of food and monetary donations. All proceeds will go to the Oak Fellow Service Center to assist in their ministries. Please note that our Yoke Fellow item is canned sweet potatoes. And please check your newsletter or your weekly e-news for a full list of announcements. We would like to have everyone's updated contact information for the new 2023 church directory. Please complete the blue form like this, which is located on the table across from the church office. You can either return it to the church office or put it in the offering plate, or you can email it to the church office, any changes. You only need to do this if your information has changed. Let us pray. Father God, you are with us with every transition and change. As we enter into this new era with excitement and even some anxiety, we recall your deep compassion, your presence, and your abounding love. We thank you for the gifts talents, and skills with which you have blessed us. We thank you for the experiences that have brought us to this moment. We thank you for the work of others that gives breadth and depth to our own work. Be with us as we move forward this new year, rejoicing with you and supporting one another. We ask this in your holy name. Amen.
New Year, everyone. You guys are the troopers. You made it here this morning. After the big parties and all the shenanigans and all that going on, you're here. So happy. Yeah, New Year's is a wonderful time because as a pastor, you can say a whole lot of things that mean may maybe a lot, maybe a little, whatever, but it's all based on this invisible line that we call New Year's where there's change. And, and so I was kind of thinking what would be a good sermon series to, uh, to jump into for the new year. And I went back to like elementary school when that, you know, that, that boy or that girl, depending, whatever, uh, would slip that note and say, you know, if you, they liked you and they said check, yes or no, right? Did anyone ever get that note? I hope everyone here got that note at some point in time. I feel bad if you didn't get that note. But we, we get that and you could say check yes or no. Very seldom was there maybe on that note. Sometimes it could be a maybe. But I also thought it was good because we do have a choice. As we go into New Year's, we have a choice to say yes or say no to some things that God wants us to do. So it's all about the, the decisions we make in the here and now, the yeses or nos, if you will, that can in so many ways affect us for a very, very long time. You see, the, the truth is that the decisions we make now are very important. In fact, I would even say that the quality of our decisions can in so many ways really determine the quality of our life, right? Why? Well, because when we make decisions, our decisions end up making us, right? See what I did? That was clever, wasn't it? Did, did you catch that? When we make decisions, our decisions can end up making us. Now, even though that's true, here's our problem. This is when the, the balloon starts going down a little bit. We're not always like, a, 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 like shining like a crazy diamond when it comes to being good decision makers, right? For example, we might say, I want to have a healthier diet. I want to eat right. Many of us have said that, including myself, but then instead of eating kale and other rabid food, oh my gosh, bleh, horrible, we end up waking up the next morning with an empty bag of Cheetos and Little Debbie wrappers and all that. Is that just me? Was that just me last night? I don't know. But anyway, we, we could make that kind of decision. And beef jerky. Or we might even say that we want to be wise with our words, but as it plays out, we continue to say things we shouldn't do. I do this all the time. I go home like almost every day saying, I know I offended someone just by being me, just by breathing, saying something like, who, who did I offend today? And, and a lot of that is because I said something that was offensive and didn't really mean it. Or it could be that we say we want to have a good, solid, godly relationship with whomever, but instead of being patient and praying and holding off for Mr. or Mrs. Wright for the right one, we end up settling for Mr. or Mrs. Wright now, right? We end up settling for less than God's best in our life. And so it goes on and on and on. So you say, yeah, we, we say we want to be good decision makers, but the problem is that we're just not good at it. We're not really good at making decisions. A lot of times we'll step off the path and prove the opposite of that is true. It's kind of like this. I said this at the Christmas sermon, I think, well, the one before that, but uh, I told you the whole Walmart experience. It got caught in my mouth. It was horrible. And, and then it, it led to getting a, a traffic violation. I, I did the California stop or the Philadelphia slide. I think I heard someone. That was cool. Philadelphia. I never heard that before. And so I was in the office this week, and I whine. I don't know if you know this about it. I whine a little bit, a little bit. A lot of it, probably. I was whining that morning, and Jennifer is just awesome. She sits at her desk, and she's doing her due diligence to get things around here organized in ways that I could never do it. But I'm sitting in my office going, why did that trooper even write that ticket for me? It didn't have anything to do other than write me a ticket for a California stop. And then Jennifer just kind of butts in and looks at me right square in the eyes and says, did you do it? Wamp, 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 wamp. I mean, what do you say? Yeah, I guess I, guess I did. I, I, I guess I did do it. So wh why is it that we struggle to make good decisions? Why is that the case? I mean, why is it that we want to do the right thing, but as it turns out so many times, we end up doing the opposite of what we should do? Well, there are at least three reasons I want to talk about today, and the first one is this. We'll just move right along. We are overwhelmed a lot of time with choices. In fact, some studies show that we'll make upwards of 35,000 decisions a day. Can you believe that? 
For example, from the moment we wake up, we make decisions like what do I eat, what do I wear, what's up on social media, should I comment, should I like this post, should I love this post, should I giggle at this post, what, do people, what are people saying to me at work, what should I say to them, should I drive faster, slower, pass that person, should I, get, should I go to Walmart, right? These are questions we ask every single day. That last one probably is no, but it's a relentless thing. It's all day long. And you see, what happens is because we have to make so many choices, our decision-making muscle literally becomes fatigued. In fact, cognitive scientists have actually termed it as decision fatigue. You see, essentially what happens is that as the volume of our decisions increase, the quality of our decisions decrease. And you see, that's, when, that's why when our decision-making muscle gets really tired, that's when we might very well make some very questionable decisions. Now, a second big problem is this. For many of us, we're afraid of making the wrong choices. Anyone in that category? Afraid? It's called analysis paralysis. We get, we, we're afraid to make the wrong choices. And this is especially true for people of faith. Why? Because we want to try to follow what God's will is for our life. So we end up saying, well, I'm not sure if this is the right school I should go to or the right job or the perfect person to be dating, etc. Therefore, since we aren't sure. Sometimes we just end up not making any decisions at all, which is honestly a real challenge because it's important for us to remember what that, uh, those great theologians, Rush, I think we have a picture of that group. You remember what they said? Yeah, these guys, you remember Rush? Tom Soria? Do I have to play that for you? No, don't make me sing it. Just look it up. But well, you remember what they said? It's right there. Even when you don't make a, you, even when you don't decide, you still have made a choice. That's still a decision. So yeah, in some, when we have to, we really have to come to terms with the fact that indecision is still a decision, because even when we don't decide, we've still made a choice. And then the third problem is this, and I want to spend a little bit more time on this one. We let our emotions overrule logic. I mean, it's kind of like this. So there's this cool documentary on, well, maybe I should, cool is not the right adjective I should use, but there's this documentary on Netflix now about a guy named Manti Teo. Do anyone know who that is? He's a linebacker, played for Notre Dame, and he was the victim of catfishing. You know what catfishing is? It's not going to your grandma's pond and, and catching fish. It's in the social media realm. It's where someone pretends to be someone else, and they end up doing it for a reason or whatever. So he was victim of it. I'm not talking anymore about that. Watch it. It's a very interesting documentary. But I have a friend who was trying to have a relationship, trying to find a girlfriend, uh, doing whatever he could, wasn't having any luck going here, there, whatever, it wasn't, wasn't making that connection, so he went to social media. And I'm not dogging social media, okay? I'm not, I'm not saying that. Maybe I am a little bit, but not, not entirely. As far as you know, I, I love social media. But he goes to this, and he goes to certain websites, and he becomes a victim of catfishing. That's what happens to him. And he's kind of desperate in this moment because of the emotion of it all. He ends up sending these people who happen to be not real people, or they're real people, but they're on the people they project to be on social media. He sends flowers. He sends money. He sends plane tickets. He sends a lot. He, to the sum, one year, $12,000. He sent to various people on social media. And guess how many dates he got out of that? A nice round number. None. He'd go to the airport to meet that person, and they were never there. They were never there because that person didn't exist. The emotions, it was an emotional or a decision based on the emotions of the moment. Now, I know that's extreme, but you see, when it comes to making important decisions, sometimes we can just let our emotions take over in the moment, and the result can be a bit south of what we had actually hoped for. For example, let's just say your kid does something bad, and all our kids have done something bad. Parents who think, say their kids are perfect, they're not perfect. Your kids are not perfect, okay? No one's kids are perfect. So when a kid does something, that sounded bad, didn't it? I didn't mean to talk about your kids. I really didn't. Maybe I just did. I don't know. Maybe I'm going to talk about my kids. Well, let's say my kid does something bad, and logic says, be patient, but then they get all sassy with you, and they're running that mouth and all that, and logic says, take them out, right? But do you do that? No, you don't take them. I mean, take them outside, you know, straighten things out a little bit. Because if you do something, say something or do something that you shouldn't have done, you're going to regret that if it's the wrong decision. Or let's just say that you have some unexpected temptation. 
and your logic says, danger, danger, Will Robinson. That, that's bad. Don't do that. But your emotion says, hey, man, you know, who's going to know? Let's party, right? Let's, let's do that. And so, as the case often proves to be, so often it's the emotional decisions that end up hurting us or hurting others the most. And Matt's, in, in, in fact, in speaking of kids, I, I tell our kids this all the time. I said, whatever you do, don't make perma permanent decisions based off of temporary emotions, right? In other words, don't make decisions that are going to impact you for years to come based on the emotion that you're feeling in that moment. You see, again, the reason our decisions matter is because the quality of our decisions, what? Determines the quality of our lives. I'm repeating that on purpose. It's important. Meaning that we make our decisions and our decisions end up making us. You see, one of the best ways to live a people-loving, God-glorifying life is to, with God's help, decide beforehand or pre-decide what we will do in any given situation that may present itself. I mean, it's kind of like this. This is what Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3 says. It says, whatever you do, commit it to the Lord. In other words, if you're dating someone, guess what you do? Commit that to the Lord. If you're married, commit your marriage to the Lord. If you're parenting, commit your parenting and your children to the Lord. So in short, if it is a financial decision or a professional decision, if it's relational, friendship, if it's what to wear, what to eat, et cetera, commit all your decisions, all 35,000 of them you make every single day, filter that through God, what Jesus would do. And then when you do that, Scripture tells us what? God will establish your plans. Why? Because they're his plans. You see how that works? You're thinking and filtering everything through who God is. You see, this is very similar to what Jesus said when he said, if you seek him first, Jesus, and his kingdom, and his righteousness, guess what happens? Then everything else will be added unto you. You see, when we allow God to help us to pre-decide what is best for us, well, then whenever we're faced with a check, yes or no kind of question like, should I look, should I do this, should I buy it, should I date this person, person etc., well, then we'll already know, we'll, we'll, we can respond with confidence because God, through the Holy Spirit, has put that on our heart. For example, and this is really relative to the, to the moment, even when that thing on Amazon, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, Eric especially maybe, even when that thing on Amazon is 95% off and they say there's only three of them left, yet you, you're so broke you can't even pay attention. I mean, that's, that's how bad. Maybe God is telling you don't buy that, don't purchase that, right? It's not a good idea. Or let's say you're always in a state of constant worry about something or someone. Any worriers in the house? Man, I worry myself sick sometimes. I'm just like, I'm a pastor. I should be like listening to myself sometimes. But then I worry and I worry. But instead of, you know, being in a state of constant worry about something or someone, and, and because you just know, you just know in your mind that anything or everything is going to go wrong with that person or situation, what you do is you pre- decide that instead of worrying and lamenting and tossing and turning and vacillating and brooding, all that stuff, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray, right? I'm going to give it to God and let God do what God does best. Easily said, right? But that's what we do. And this last one, which I need to listen to, but when someone cuts you off in traffic and gives you that Hawaiian peace sign, you know what I'm talking about? You know, you know what I'm talking about. You certainly do. Sometimes you just got to let it go. You got to go frozen, right? You got to let it go. Got to move on. I need to learn that one myself because you don't know what that person went through who cut you off in traffic. Maybe someone coughed in their mouth in Walmart. I don't know. I wasn't there. If you know, you know. You see, we see this kind of pre-deciding, this pre-decision all through Scripture, really, um, starting with, I mean, in Genesis 22, when, when God told Abraham, and I love this story because it's crazy, but God told Abraham, hey, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. Of course, I, Abraham said, say, hey, man, I have nothing to do today. Let's, let's, go, let's go do that. Sounds like fun. No, he didn't say that. He was like, that's crazy. Why, why would I do that? But Abraham based 
his knowledge of God beforehand, that God was always faithful, God was trustworthy, and that I am going to do whatever God wants me to do. So he had already pre-decided that if God asked him, if God sent him somewhere, or God asked him to do something, I'm going to do it because God is the one who asked me, and I will obey and honor him in all things. Also, Ruth, one of my favorite characters in Scripture, but Ruth, where she made a very strong commitment to who? Naomi, and decided ahead of time that whatever happens in the future, no matter where I'm going, where you're going, I'm going. Your people are my people, and your God is my God. And then we have Daniel, and we'll talk more about Daniel in the weeks to come as the series continues, but we have Daniel, and he and his friends were essentially taking hostage to a foreign land, and they were brainwashed and starved and imprisoned, and even though they were basically given little or no option as to whether or not uh, what they could eat, Daniel said this in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. He says, Daniel resolved or predecided not to defile himself with the royal food or wine. He set himself up for the standards of God and God alone. You see, for Abraham, Ruth, Daniel, and so many others in Scripture, because of the character and the goodness and the faithfulness of God, they knew who and what they valued the most. So as we bring this home this morning, because you look tired, I'm tired. I am tired. 1.30 bedtime. Whew, that's rough. Anyway, as we, as we, I didn't need to say that out loud. I feel like confessing today. Is that okay? Good morning, everyone. I'm still here. So as we bring this home this morning, I want to end with a question kind of hinging off what I just said. And this is important. I want you to process this. I want you to answer this. Not out loud. I don't need that this morning, okay? Too much noise. But I want you to answer this. I want you to really think about this. What is it? Here's the question. What do you value the most? I didn't mean to point at anybody. What do you value the most? I mean, what is the most important thing or things to you? For example, when people talk about you, what, what do they say? I mean, do they say, wow, he or she is a person of integrity, a good soul, or a reliable and generous spirit? Or do they say, well, there goes such and such, what a heaping sack of misery, mayhem, and meanness? Which one are you? There's really no, is a yes or a no kind of thing. You see, what you value is often the first thing that people see when you come a-knocking. For example, you might say, I value faithfulness. I want to be faithful to my God, my friends, and my loved ones. Or you might say, I value purity. So in a world full of lust, you know, there's value to me physically that I'm not going to yield. God says, go to a higher standard. I'm not going to dip below that. Or you might say, I value generosity. And because my God is a giver, I'm going to be a giver as well. Matter of fact, I know we've all read this, but there's a wonderful author who's no longer with us anymore. His name is Fyodor Dostoevsky. Ever heard of him? Philosophy grad, I'm sorry. I just got, I had to go there sometimes. But he wrote this, this short story, novella, really, called Notes from the Underground. And there's this anonymous character who's was kind of driving, he's kind of the narrator in the story. And he starts out the book, kind of pulls you in. He said, I'm a mean man. I'm a nasty man. And you know throughout the entire story, he lives into that title. He's a mean man. He's a nasty man. What are you saying about yourself? How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a pretty good person that's following hard after God? Is that what you want to do in 2023? Or is it same old, same old? I hate to go to it again, but is it same as it ever was? Same as it ever was. Is this another year? Is this an invisible line? There's going to be no change in my life because I've arrived. Now, I don't think anyone here thinks that. But, folks, that's why we continue spinning wheels as, a, as, as humans is because somehow we think we've got it figured out. But do we? What do you value the most? What does 2023 look like for you? What do you want to see change in your narrative, in the church narrative, in the community narrative, in the faith narrative, etc.? So, with that said, you all look mad at me now. So, with that said, how are your values, your descriptors of yourself 
setting the tone for your own narrative. How is that working in your own life? You see, when we can clearly define our values or what we stand for, our decisions will become a natural overflow of that choice. And as a result, our decisions become so much easier. And our presence in this world as a person of faith is better defined. And check this out. People will even recognize us as being people of faith, right? And that hasn't always been a good thing. Oh, they go to church. They go to that one. You know how they feel about this group of people or that group of people. We're not, that, we're not like that. We're not like that. Why? Because we were made in the image of God, and God's not like that, right? So if you worship God, if you follow God, don't be that. That is not our narrative. You see, this is how it all plays out. I, am, I said I was winding down. I'm going to Betsy. I'm sorry. I keep going. I just keep pulling my own string, and I keep going. But I am coming. I'm winding down. This is how it all plays out. Decisions determine direction, and direction determines destiny, meaning that our unwise decisions tend to compound negatively, and our wise, God-honoring decisions tend to compound in a positive and God-honoring kind of way. Isn't that neat how that algorithm works? Therefore, as you look at what you value, and I really, really, really hope you do that. I read you to do some self-examination. If nothing else in January, besides celebrating my birthday, that's an important thing we do in January. Okay, we do it every year. Okay, I'll throw that out there. But I do hope you answer, fill in that blank. What is it that you value? And then you ask yourself this question. Are my decisions moving me in that direction? Is it moving the ball forward? What I believe, my values, values, is it moving me in that direction? Or in other words, if my life is moving in the direction of my decisions, also important, do I like the direction my decisions are taking me? Ask yourself that. Because you see, if you don't, maybe it's time you take your life back. What is driving your life now? Is it your faith? Is it your football team? Is it something else? Is it people? Or is it God? What's driving your life? You see, when I'm standing at a crossroads and I have to answer yes or no, I need to ask myself, what am I basing that decision on? My gut, my emotion, what I think I know already, the fact that I've arrived, etc. Or is it based on the unwavering, flawless character of a God who created us, who knows us better than anyone, and wants us to live a life worth the effort, right? And so, over the next few weeks, what we're going to be doing in this series is we're going to be on a journey of self-discovery. Aren't we happy about this? Isn't it wonderful? Cakes and pies. Are we excited? So, I'm excited, if no one else is. We're going to be on this journey of self-discovery where we're going to find out exactly, this is the existential question, maybe spiritually, who we are, why we are, what's going on, what, what we value, and how that stacks up to where God wants us to be. You see, when you know who you are, you'll know what to do. And I say that because when our values are clear, our decisions are what? They are easier. So the question is this, and I am ending right now, Betsy. I'm, this is, this, I'm done. What decisions are you making now to make your values a reality? I want you to really process that because it's going to be very important as we build upon this sermon going forward. We're going to unpack this more specifically. Let's pray. Most Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your direction. We thank you for your mind and your spirit that leads and directs us. I pray that um, we listen to your voice. We listen when we're making, we have all these decisions coming at us every, every day that they're always filtered through what you would want us to do that your way is always a better way. You created us. You know us. And you think we're pretty special. Sometimes the problem is we think we're pretty special too in a different way, and we forget that we need you, that we need to rely on you. So I pray that maybe this is the year that, that we really, really, all of us, every single one of us gets this, that we really need to lean on you. We need, really need to see this world. We need to see this church, see ourselves individually through your eyes that we do have blind spots. There are things we can improve and that as we're growing in your grace that we'll realize, wow, there's a, a much bigger world out there than we even imagined, that your table is much wider and longer than we could ever fathom. 
that this sense of communion that we have with you is to be shared. It's not to be held to ourselves selfishly. It's for everyone. You're a God who created all human beings, and you love all of us equally. So I pray we, we understand that. That's part of our value system is that we've got to find a way to make that table longer and wider and more inclusive for all your people, all the people, all of your creation. Lord, thank you for making us aware of this. Thank you as um, we go into this new year, the possibilities that we have. Um, that I, I just pray this is a catalyst that we can do some wonderful things in your name. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I can't think of a better time to do this. Yeah, I just keep talking, right? You open your eyes, I'm still standing up here, still talking. My wife says that all the time. She's like, would you ever stop? <laughs> she didn't say that, but she said it with her looks a couple times. So she hadn't said that specifically, but I think she wants to right now. But as you know, with me and being a pastor, I, I am a little socially awkward. If you haven't noticed that, I am a little bit different. But one thing I tell you what just really resonates with my soul, it always has, is the Lord's Supper. I love, love, love communion. I wept like a little child the first time I served it. I couldn't get the liturgy out. I don't know, know what I said, but I was boo-hooing. And the church was looking at me like, what is wrong with you? And they didn't. They, they gave me grace that day, but they, they got it. I hope you get this. This is a moment where we stand and we, we're, we're sharing with each other, the horizontal and the vertical with God, that we're, we're, we're exclaiming our faith that God is real, God is up to something, God is good, and we're all our brother's keeper, right? Wow, when we get that, what an amazing difference that'll make in this world. Folks, that's what communion really is, is that we're saying we agree with Christ, you know, and we love each other because we agree through Christ. Did you ever think about it that way? We're standing in the presence of a good and loving God who wants us to honor and glorify him and love each other. That's it. It's really as simple as that. How are we doing with that? Well, we, there's potential. We have time, right, maybe, to do better. I think we can, we can raise the bar, all of us. Every single one of us can raise the bar. Look at this community through different eyes this year and say, how can I help? We're doing this now, and that's good, but what else can I do? What does it look like differently this year? Let's make this table wider and broader so there will be more chairs and more people can sit there. I'm not talking about filling pews. You know that's really not even on my radar as far as that goes. I'd rather see transformation. I want to see transformation. I want to see the love of Christ spread ever, wherever we go. That's what it's all about. That's communion. Who are we inviting to this table? Amen. I'm going to invite my lovely assistant up here as we start to. Now, the night of his betrayal, Jesus took the bread and after he blessed it, he gave it to his friends and said, take, eat. This is my body, which was broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup of the vine and after he blessed it, he gave it to his, his best pals he traveled with for three years. And he said, take, drink. This is the blood of the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it. What we'll do is, as normal, and we'll start with each row, and, and uh, you come forward and, and, and spend time at the altar if, if needed. Everyone is invited. All we ask, we, and I love the fact that Methodists, uh, we practice open table. You are all invited to this table. We ask that if there's any, you know, I, I don't care if you're just kicking the tires of the faith, you're welcome at this table. We ask if it's in a mocking spirit that you stay where you are. But if you're, if you're exploring your faith, you want to know more about Christ, this is a wonderful way to explore your faith. So come forward. It's the body of Christ broken for you. Christ broken for you. The body of 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 Christ broken for you. Body of 
Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. And the body of Christ broken for you. 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 The body of Christ broken for you, brother. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken. Body Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. Body Christ broken for you, brother. Body Christ broken for you, brother. Body Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you.
the podium like I was going for part two there. I'm not going to do that. Um, so many things going on, so many wonderful things. And I was just kidding about celebrating January as my birthday, unless you were already going to do that. that that's, I'm not asking you to do it, just saying. I just want to make that clear. That would be kind of cool. But anyway, we don't have to do that. Uh, a lot of cool things going on uh, at the church this month. I'm really looking forward. I feel the challenge to, to up our game. I feel that a whole church can feel that sense of God's up to something here. And uh, just just be receptive to what God is saying. Hopefully starting starting now more than ever of what God is putting on your heart, what type of ministry or maybe your, your role in the church, those types of things. So, um, just be very mindful of that as God moves us forward in 2023. Can you believe that? 2023. Wow, this is crazy. This was like space age back in the day, wasn't it? Uh, space odyssey kind of things. Really, really bizarre. We're, we're here, 2023. I'll stop talking now. Any other announcements? Any rehashing of anything? Nothing. Okay, well, let's, let's pray and we'll dismiss. Most Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this... Uh, this New Year's for another year, um, the promises that come with the New Year, uh, I, I pray that we're listening to you, we're attentive to uh, the will of your spirit as you, as you put these things on our heart. I pray we always remember that church starts now, that there's so much stuff to do, that this gathering is wonderful, it's a wonderful time to come together and praise you and give you glory, but the work actually starts now, where we need to get in the world and show your light and show your love. So I pray that we live into that, we live into the blessing it is to be your church, uh, because there's so much work to do in this world. So Lord, thank you for this church, thank you for the, the heart of, of, of who, who we are as a denomination, I feel, I really, really do, and specifically right here in, in Spindale, Spindale Methodist, I know this church has a heart for this community, and I pray we just continue to move forward um, with that and helping people right here where we are. Of course, in Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. God bless you. Happy New Year. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.